You guys here paying attention? Do you guys want to come up front here for a minute? All right. Brady, there is a Bible that was ordered for you. Dom, there's a Bible that was ordered for you as well. And there's the Bible handbook, I believe, that you chose, right? And so if you guys turn around for a second, the congregation can see these fine young men, the next generation of the Lincoln Park Church of Christ. And it's so great to have them up here. It's so great to, to, ha to have them confess Christ and see the blood of Christ wash over them. I told them, I said, you'll never be cleaner than at this moment, right? I said, try to make it last 6 to 12 hours at least. <laughs> never forget, we're always sinners in need of a Savior, but it doesn't mean we don't strive to continue to do right, right? And so we need to make sure that when we find sin in our lives, that we repent and we turn away from it. That's what the, uh, Jesus did on that cross for us. So thank you, gentlemen. Go back to your seats, and we want to uh, thank them for their, their sacrifice. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. I love the energy in here this morning. I love the singing this morning. Everybody's doing a wonderful job. It's always nice to, to feel that energy in the auditorium, you know. When I think about this lesson here this morning... It's reasons to believe. Last, last week we talked about, is there a God? And I've done lessons about these things before. Uh, is there a God? Can we know there's a God? Is the Bible the word of God? Did Jesus really resurrect? Was Jesus a real person of history? We've, we've looked at some of these things. We've talked about some of these things. But one that I haven't done in, in a while is about the resurrection, the proofs for the resurrections. Can we know? And in Bible study this morning, we were talking about our faith. We were talking about salvation. And in 1 John chapter 5, and verse 13, the Apostle John, he says, I am writing these things so that you can know that you are saved. You don't have to hope for salvation. You don't say, man, I hope I get in. I think I might get in. I, you know. No, you can actually know that you are saved. You can know that the resurrection was real. You can know that Jesus was a real person of history. You can know that God exists if... And there's that transitional word, right? If you're willing to do your part, if you're willing to invest the time in investigating these truths, the evidence is there. And at no other time in human history have we had more access to this evidence, to these facts. You could go online and most of them are free. And if you don't have a computer, you could go to a public library and you could jump on their computer and their Wi-Fi and you could research these things. There's no excuse that we have to not know these things. Why is it important to know if there's a God, to know if Christ was real, to know about the resurrection and the proofs? Because it will strengthen your faith. I was watching uh, this last couple, the last couple of days, me and Christy, every, every year around Easter, I know a lot of people do, but we watched, uh, a couple nights ago, we watched The Risen, right? That's the, we watched that one, that's the story of the resurrection, but it's told through the, uh, one of the Roman soldiers' point of view. Uh, last night we watched The Passion, and I've heard Christians in the past, I don't like to watch The Passion, Dave, it's just, it's too gruesome, it's too gory, that's the point. That's what he suffered. Your sin, and mine, and the rest of the world did that to him. And so, if you're having a weak moment in your faith, if you're, if you're struggling sometimes, pop in The Passion. Remember what Jesus Christ had done for the world. Remember how even in this moment of weakness, who pops up in the scene? Satan. And he kept trying to tell him, there's no way that one man could take upon the sins of the world and all that responsibility. And then he stomps on the snake's head. You see, I love that movie. I love that movie because I, I like to watch it. I watch it every year simply to remind myself, like I told my son last night, that's why we do what we do. That's why we make the necessary life changes that we make because we realize the sacrifice that Jesus Christ had made on our behalf. And so, brothers and sisters, as we look at on the screen behind me the reasons to believe in the resurrection, this is something that is so very important because this is the most important human event in history. The most important event in human history is the resurrection. Because if there's no God, we're just a bunch of dumb animals like we talked about last week. And there is no such thing as oppression, right or wrong, injustice or justice. 
There's just natural if we're all animals that have evolved, right? So we talked about why there's a God, but we also need to realize why it's so important if there's a resurrection. Because if there's no resurrection, then Jesus Christ died for his own sins. He's still in the grave, and then there's no hope for us. Because then the Messiah then hasn't come if Jesus wasn't the Messiah, and we're still in our sins. So the resurrection is one of the most important events in human history. And so that statement, brethren, that I often make, you guys hear me say, especially in the last year or so, how often do you consider the idea that we are immortal beings? You're immortal. Sure, your flesh is going to go back into the ground in which it came. But we know that our spirit is going to live on in eternity. And it's like the, 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 the meme that I shared on Facebook this week. But the question is location, location, location. You're going to live on forever. But which location? There's only two. You get heaven or hell. Which one are you going to choose? And so we look at this information here this morning. And I want us to consider about the resurrection. That there is only hope of eternity and only hope of eternal life through God and through those who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Amen. And without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. Because if Jesus didn't resurrect, as I said, then he's still in the grave. And then we are all hopeless. But here's the great news. We have already proved that God exists. And we know that uh, as human beings, it tells us in Romans chapter 1, that we are without excuse. Because God has made himself known to us by what has been created. And so we talked about that in, uh, last week and in previous lessons. But we have already also proved that Jesus was a real person of history. We have also proved that Jesus was the Son of God, which is the manifestation of God in the flesh. And so as we look at this information about the resurrection this morning, I'm going to give you literally just a, just a fraction of the information that's available to us. Just for expedience sake, time's sake, I don't have time to go over all the evidence, but I'm going to give you some of the evidence. How much evidence does a man need? Does he need at least 50 pieces, 100 pieces, or will just a couple pieces do? Truth is truth, right? Right is right. Either it happened or it didn't. Is there evidence that points to the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? And we're going to start in Old Testament prophecy. When I think about the Old Testament, it was clearly stated and predicted that the, that the resurrection was going to happen for the Messiah. When I think of Isaiah 53... All of us, you know, it's been quoted many times at the Lord's table. And I think of Isaiah chapter 53. And after describing the suffering, the death, and the burial of the Messiah in Isaiah 53 and verses about 5 through 9, we know that the text says that he shall prolong his days. Isaiah 53. I don't have this on the screen behind me. I'm only going to have a few passages of scripture behind me. You guys can go back. I could either email you the lesson or I could have you, if you want to just write them down as I go. But you think about Isaiah chapter 53. You know why that was important? Because he prophesied that 700 years. 700 years before Jesus was ever born. It was prophesied exactly what was going to happen. I think of David in Psalm 16. That describes an individual as the Holy One, whose soul will not be left in Sheol. Sheol, Hades, that's the place of departed spirits. It says, nor did his body suffer decay, we learn in Psalm 16 and in verse 10. Why is that important? Because that was prophesied almost a thousand years before the birth of Jesus Christ. You know, you look at this information... And it is crystal clear that the death, the burial, and the resurrection in regards to the Messiah was a truth that is found in the Old Testament time and time again. There are, Jesus fulfilled over, uh, uh, over 200 prophecies in one form or another, but he fulfilled 60 major prophecies in great, uh, just minute detail. And as you look at this information, brethren, in addition to the Old Testament prophecies, Jesus plainly predicted his own death and resurrection. During his life and his ministry, the first passage that we're going to look at this morning is in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21. If you want to open your Bibles, you can follow along there. Or the few that we do have this morning, it will be on the screen behind me. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21, notice what the Bible tells us. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. From the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes and be killed, and be raised up on the third day. 
Brethren, this prediction was given so clearly, it was given so publicly, that even the enemies of Jesus understood that, uh, what he was claiming. They understood that you're going to kill me, and I'm going to raise from the dead. And I know this to be true because I look at the next passage of Scripture on the screen behind me, and that's Matthew chapter 27. Notice what the, the Jewish leaders said when they went to Pilate. In Matthew chapter 27, and verse 62 and following, it says, Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that this deceiver said, After three days I will rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be made worse than the first. You look at these couple passages of scriptures, and now I want to kind of just kind of dive into just some of the evidence that's available to us. Much more evidence is available than what I have time to cover, but just look at what I have for you here this morning. Think about the number of witnesses. You know, it would be one thing if one or two people claimed to see the, ra the risen Christ, and then you could argue about the validity of that story. But I know that when I think about the Apostle Paul and his writings, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he tells us that over 500 people, 500 individuals, witnessed the resurrected Jesus. And if 500 people uh, witness something or eyewitnesses of something, you might want to pay attention to what they have to say. You might want to take that event seriously. In addition to that, this does not include all the people who saw the events that had taken place on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. It doesn't include the miracles of the apostles that had started in Acts chapter 3 and followed throughout their ministry. Brethren, there are proofs that Jesus was raised and we also know that he was seated at the right hand of the Father and that he sent the Holy Spirit as he had promised that he was going to send. And so listen to what it says in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 33 through 36, the scriptures tell us, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having been received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself, David himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, meaning Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So brethren, we know that we see here that the Apostle Paul, uh, or the Apostle Peter, as he's talking here in Acts chapter 2, is telling the thousands of people that were gathered that you know that Jesus was crucified because you're the ones that put him to death. That right there in and of itself shows that Jesus was a real person of history. The enemies of Jesus never even doubted that he was a real person. They never doubted the fact that he did miraculous things because they recorded them. They talked about them. They wrote about them. But as we think about all those eyewitnesses, I want you to think about the Gospels. I want you to think about the honesty of these accounts. You know, if I'm making up a story, a fictional story, I'm probably going to write in, a, in things about myself. I'm probably going to write myself in probably in, 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 a, in a positive way, a positive light. And yet we see brutal honesty from the men who pen the scriptures about their own cowardice. And I think about what was written in the scriptures. I think about the Gospels and how it talks about the truth. And the disciples who penned the, the scriptures wrote of their own shortcomings. Think about this. The apostles all fled, it tells us, when Jesus was arrested. And we learn about that in Matthew's Gospel. Wasn't Matthew one of the apostles? And yet he wrote about his own cowardice and the fact that he fled at the moment of persecution when they came to arrest Jesus. I think about in the Gospel of John in chapter 20, we know that Jesus didn't first appear to his apostles, he appeared to women. Because who were the first ones who went to the tomb? The women went to the tomb. We know that they refused to believe uh, after hearing the account of the women who witnessed, um, who witnessed the angels, who witnessed the resurrection as far as the aftermath of the resurrection. They'd gone back to the disciples to tell them what they had been told, and they, were, they didn't believe. 
And so there's a lack of belief. There's cowardice and fear and, and shame upon them. And we know that Jesus rebuked them. We learn about that in Mark chapter 16. We know that they were fearful and not courageous. We learn about that in John chapter 20. So I like to look at the idea of how truthful the gospel accounts were. That's the one thing I love about the Bible. When you read about all the men and women that grace the pages of the Bible, it doesn't show them in all their glory. It shows them in their, their successes as well as their failures. And you can see that these were real people who messed up just like the rest of us do. We have good days and we have bad days, and so did they. I think about the historical data when I think about the resurrection. You know, from the gospel accounts, we learn that the authorities confirmed the fact that Jesus had died before they released the body for burial. We learn about it, we read about it in Mark chapter 15. They know he was dead. The Roman soldiers know he was dead. And so we also know that people handled the body after they brought the body down from the cross. You would have realized if there was still life in the body. These were professionally trained killers. They would have known if there was still life in Jesus' body. And yet his lifeless body comes down from the cross. They prepare it for burial. They wrap it. They, they cover it in spices. They wrap his body. They place it in the tomb. And yet there was no detection of life. Why? Because the man was dead. And you also think about the burial wrappings. When you think about the burial wrappings that were left in the tomb, the scriptures tell us that the linen wrappings that were in the tomb, when the apostles came, or when the disciples came, it amazed them. Because Jesus just seemed to levitate right out of them. And then he even took the face cloth and he folded it up and set it on the side. But yet the Bible, or the Jewish priest, paid the uh, Roman soldiers, the Roman guards, in order to say that, well, I fell asleep and they came and stole the body. Well, we're going to look at that idea here tonight. Is there any validity to that? And the answer is a resounding no. Because if somebody's going to come and steal the body to try to sneak by four Roman mercenaries, Roman soldiers, and try not to wake them up as they're moving this huge stone that weighs thousands of pounds probably, and then they're just going to unwrap the body and leave the stuff behind? No, they're going to throw them over the shoulder and hightail out of there. So you think about it logically. You think about this information, brethren. I also want us to spend a little time and talk about this extremely large stone. I want to think about the idea that the scriptures tell us that the, the tomb was sealed. What does that mean that it was sealed? I want to think about the idea of the guard that was placed there. Because we need to closely examine these things to understand that how silly the arguments are, are made about the stealing of the body. Think about the stone. The stone for this, for this rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, his tomb was a brand new tomb, so there's no other bodies laid in there. So there wouldn't have been like a chance that somehow the body was uh, misidentified or something. Jesus was the only one that's been in this tomb. This tomb had a large stone that was rolled in front of it. And we are told that if, by historians that those stones were so large and so cumbersome, they would have weighed upwards of one and a half to two tons. Right? Several thousand pounds. And it would have taken several men with levers in order to get the stone in place in the first place. But we're to believe that somebody snuck by the soldiers and just kind of rolled it out of the way very quietly while they're sleeping. Right there on duty. I mean, how ridiculous is that? And so you think about that stone and how heavy it was. It would have caused, it would have taken great effort and caused great commotion to move it. Oh, by the way, it's the middle of the night. I don't remember any street lights probably being on. It was pitch black. And so you think about this. You think about the Roman guard here this morning. The Roman guard unit usually consists of four soldiers that were stationed at the tomb. But this is so very important because we have to consider the idea of these soldiers. These were strict, strictly disciplined fighting men. And when you think about Roman soldiers and their uh, missions that they were given, if they were to fail in their missions, it often required their own deaths. It required their own deaths, which were oftentimes torturous and humiliating. So let's consider the idea that they would have fled as the, as, as the, as the Jew, Jewish leaders would want us to believe. 
Brethren, the text says that the Roman guards fled. They left their place of responsibility. Well, how can we wrap our minds around and explain the idea that these Roman military individuals were so disciplined and they knew that there was such a fear from their superiors because if they would have failed in their assignment, it would have likely, most often, brought upon their own torturous death. What type of death? Well, many times the guards would be put to death by stripping them down, scourging them, and then using their own clothes, they set them on fire and they burn them to death. How often do you think they probably were trying to fail at their missions? Do you think it was probably likely that, hey, we just took a nap with that type of uh, consequence hanging over your head? And so you think about this. There was an individual named Dr. George Curry. It's a stu he is a student of uh, Roman military discipline. And he wrote that the fear of punishment produced flawless attention to detail and duty, especially during the night watches. So next I want us to think about this Roman seal. What does it mean, a Roman seal? The Roman seal was affixed to the stone that was in front of the tomb, and that secured the tomb. And the, 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 the seal itself, it stood for the power and authority of the Roman Empire. For anybody to break that seal, they would have incurred the wrath of the Roman Empire. And breaking the seal meant automatic execution and crucifixion. And so you think about that. What was the chances that somebody, that these uh, disciples of Christ were going to be willing to, uh, to incur the wrath of the Roman government? To be crucified? What do we know? As soon as Jesus was arrested, they fled for their lives. Peter says, I don't know this man. And yet he denied him three times. They're fleeing for their lives. They're hiding in fear. They're cowering and they're depressed. They don't know what to do. But all of a sudden they hurry up and gain up the courage to, to, to take on these soldiers and move this thousand pound stone in the middle of the night. No, come on. Look at the Bible. Look at the facts. Look at it logically, brethren. We know that anyone that was there or anyone that was trying to do that uh, it wasn't definitely a disciple of Jesus Christ because they were all hiding in fear. Now I want to consider the fact that the followers of Christ were persecuted and killed while proclaiming the resurrection. Think about this for a minute. Jesus' disciples fled when Jesus was arrested and taken away for trial, as I said, prior to being crucified. They were afraid that they would be imprisoned or even killed for their association with Jesus. Peter, as I said, denied him three times, just as Jesus predicted. And after Jesus was crucified and buried, the disciples remained in hiding. They were afraid, they were depressed, they were distraught, until Mary and the other women had come back and gave an account of their resurrection. And so ask yourself, why would these men who had displayed such cowardice risk their own lives all of a sudden by going from city to city to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Brethren, if they did not truly believe that Jesus had risen from the dead, why would they then be willing to sacrifice everything for something that they didn't believe? Who here, if you make up a story, you and a few buddies, and then you make up the story, you know it's a lie, and then your first buddy gets killed for it, your second buddy gets killed for it, and then they come for you, hey, it's a prank, we made it up. There's no truth here. I want to live. Nobody's going to be willing to die a torturous death where they were taking Christians and throwing them in, in the Colosseum and they were being eaten by lions. They were being set on fire. Their families were being destroyed. If this wasn't something, <clears throat> excuse me, that was true. And so, brethren, this certainly gained, they, these individuals, these disciples, they gained nothing from an earthly standpoint for doing that. These disciples did not receive wealth or prestige. They uh, uh, for the preaching of the resurrection. There was no material benefit whatsoever. What they received for their, for their actions was they were beaten, they were stoned to death, they were thrown to the lions, they were tortured, and they were crucified for their preaching of Christ and the resurrection. Think about that. Ask yourself, brethren, something significant must have happened from his crucifixion to Pentecost. Because these men who were shown to be cowards and were hiding in fear, now all of a sudden are speaking boldly, are willing to go to their deaths, are willing to be set on fire, are willing to have their families destroyed, lose all their earthly possessions, 
while they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Something mighty indeed, something significant must have happened during that time. And that significant something was the resurrection. That significant second something was the power that had come upon the disciples by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit engulfed them and filled them with the power of God. Remember what is written in Luke chapter 24 behind me. In Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 49, notice what the scriptures say. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all these things which were written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds. Notice he said he opened their minds to the scripts to the understand the scriptures. And he said to them, <clears throat> Thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city, stay in Jerusalem, until you have, you have been clothed with power from on high. Brethren, you look at that passage of Scripture. And then you think about Acts chapter 2. These same apostles received power that was promised to them. And then all of a sudden, the same group of men had become courageous in their preaching. Courageous in their willingness to, 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 to do all that Christ had asked them to do. They were defying the authorities, we learn in, in Acts chapter 4. They were willing to be beaten, and then were glorifying in it. That they, were, they, found it, they found themselves to be willing to suffer on the account of Christ, we learn about in Acts 5 and other places. They were beaten with rods. They were working miracles. They were given arguments uh, for the resurrection based on Old Testament scripture. And so all of a sudden, they're pointing to the scriptures and why these things had to happen. What caused such a major turnaround? Something significant must have happened. And that something significant was the resurrection. Think about the apostle, uh, well, at, his, at this time, think about Saul of Tarsus, who eventually goes on to be the apostle Paul. How does one explain the 180 degree transition to Christianity from the man who was one of the most zealous persecutors of the early Christian church? How does one explain that? Well, it's only explainable because we know that in Acts chapter 9 that Paul was breathing threats and slaughter upon all that he came, that he came in contact with that were Christians. But while on his way to arrest these many Christians and stand by and hold the coats of those who were stoning Stephen, then shortly thereafter at the Acts chapter 9 and verse 22, we see that this same individual had his heart pricked his mind opened, and he realized that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the Son of God. That Jesus, in fact, in, in, uh, raised from the dead. And so, you look at this, brethren. What caused that crazy, all of a sudden, turnaround? It was the realization that Jesus was who he said he was. It was the realization that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. And then he goes on, and he spent the rest of his life before he was martyred, preaching the gospel and teaching each and every person who would be willing to hear him about the, the, the salvation and the hope that is only found in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, as I close this lesson down, think about this. The only, the only alternative left, after examining the resurrection and all of its details and all of the facts, is that Jesus was raised from the dead. Think about it, brothers and sisters. This is just a fragment of the information that is available to us. So be the type of believer that satisfies your curiosity with time spent investigating these things. Satisfy your curiosity. Investigate these things. Be willing to ask the difficult questions, but be willing to follow the facts, the details, no matter where they may lead you. Because if you do, and you have an open heart and an open mind, you will see that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the Redeemer and Savior of the world. Brothers and sisters, shame on those in the world today who question these things and are too lazy to seek out the truth. We need to be the type of individuals, as I close this lesson down, who 
learn about these things, know these things, and then take this information and share it with everybody who will be willing to listen. Because it is the most important event in human history. There's nothing more important than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if there is no resurrection, there's no Christianity. And we are all hopelessly still in our sins. And then we are probably no better than those animals that we talked about last week. But we know there's a God. We know that he was a real person in history. We know that he resurrected. And we know that we have the power of the Holy Spirit residing in each and every one of us who have given our lives over to Christ in baptism. If that is your desire today to become a child of God, you can do that. If you're here today and you're suffering, if you're here today and you've got a heavy heart, you can come forward and we can pray for you. You can meet with the elders. You can meet with myself. And we'll sit here and help you in any way that we can and put a plan in place to help you to have a, a deeper, stronger, uh, more passionate, zealous faith. But if you're here today and you're not a Christian and that is your desire, come forward as we stand and sing the song of invitation.